of the replay to all the registrants. At the closing, please stay tuned to learn more about Keep It Real Diverse 2. And now it is my pleasure to turn the program over to Dr. Jamal Watson, editor at large at Diverse Issues and Higher Education. Jamal? Thank you, Sine, and welcome everyone. In the wake of the recent killings of Ahmed Arbery, Rihanna Teller, George Floyd, Rayshard Brooks, and so many others, we felt that it was necessary to have a conversation about racism and structural inequity in America, with a particular focus on the role that higher education must play in addressing this very issue. With the help of an outstanding panel over the next 90 minutes, we will grapple with the problems, but also offer some solutions on how higher education can be a leader in confronting systemic racism. I invite you to be a part of the discussion. Use the chat below to send your questions. I'll try to get to as many as possible and feel free to head over to Twitter and share your thoughts and be sure to tag us at Diverse Issues. Let me now introduce our panel. We have Dr. Fred A. Bonner II, endowed professor and chair of educational leadership and counseling and founding executive director and chief scientist of the Minority Achievement, Creativity and High Ability Center at Prairie View A&M University. Welcome, Dr. Bonner. We now have Dr. Donna Y. Ford, a distinguished professor of Education and Human Ecology at The Ohio State University's College of Education and Human Ecology. Like Dr. Bonner, Dr. Ford writes a regular blog for diverse issues in higher education. Welcome, Dr. Ford. We have Dr. Eve Solomon Fernandez, who is the 10th president of Greenfield Community College in Western Massachusetts. Welcome, Madam President. And we have Dr. Kyle Southern, who is the policy and advocacy director of higher education and workforce at Young Invincibles, an organization that is committed to amplifying the voices of young adults in the political process. Welcome, Dr. Southern. And finally, we are fortunate to have Bakari Sellers, an attorney, political analyst on CNN, who made history when he was elected to South Carolina's legislature at the age of 22. His recently released memoir, My Vanishing Country, which I have just finished and highly recommended uh, to all of you uh, to read, uh, is now listed on the New York Times bestseller list. Congratulations, Mr. Sellers, and welcome. I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge that today our nation celebrates Juneteenth, the anniversary of the date in 1865, when news of the Emancipation Proclamation finally reached Texas two and a half years after the actual proclamation ending slavery. Two days ago also marked the fifth anniversary of the Charleston church shooting, where nine African Americans were killed by a white supremacist during Bible study and Mother Emanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church. I want to start with Mr. Sellers because you are a native South Carolinian. You knew the late pastor of Emanuel AME Church, the Reverend Clementa Pinkney. Well, I was hoping if you could share with us what are your thoughts today on this five year anniversary of this horrific massacre? And what are your thoughts as the nation continues to grapple with one violent racist incident after the other? Well, first of all, Dr. Watson, I am from the big city of Denmark, South Carolina, as you probably read in my vanishing country, where we have uh, three stoplights and a blinking light. Uh, but we are home to Voorhees College, uh, where I know the former president extremely well, my father, uh, Cleveland Sellers, uh, and Denmark Technical College. So we are punching above our weight uh, when it comes to higher education in the big city of Denmark. And my mom and dad would always tell me the two most important words in the English language are the words thank you and they're not nearly said enough. And so let me just start by simply saying thank you to putting this on at a very crucial time. A lot of times we get caught up in uh, Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech and we remember the rhythmic cadence of I Have a Dream that one day we shall. But we forget about the most important part of that speech in which he talks about the fierce urgency of now. And this is a very, very important moment. Um, yesterday, uh, uh, and was it yesterday or day, day before yesterday was extremely tough for me. Um, 
it was a difficult day, I can't lie. I'm someone who is very emotional, who um, uh, feels my emotions and shows my emotions. And I knew Clem very well. I was actually two blocks away uh, when the shooting happened. And one of the things that I recall um, is that Clem went out, and I'll, I'll be brief because I know we have other panelists, but Clem went out in the way that, that I would imagine him to go. He, they let a straggly white boy that they didn't know into their Bible study wearing a backpack. And he sat around a table with 12 other people. And Clem didn't put him at the back of the church. Clem set him right by him. And they worshiped with this boy they didn't know. And they worshiped and they taught and they prayed for a full hour. And then as they were saying the benediction, Dylan Roof shot Clem in the neck and proceeded to shoot eight others. And so yes, that type of violence that we've seen in our communities is not new. And so you asked me a question and I'm going to, uh, I'm going to treat you like I treat Don Lemon most nights, which is just answer the question I wanna, I wanna answer, not necessarily the one you asked, so forgive me. Um, but we've been here before, right? Um, in 1955 with uh, the country paying attention to Mammy Till having an open casket for her son Emmett. Um, we've been here before when the nightly news for the first time in history covered the Evan Pettus Bridge and black folk being beaten within an inch of their life and water hose being poured on them um, in Selma. We, we've been here before uh, um, April 4th of 68 with the death of King. Uh, we've been here before five years ago in Charleston and the president, our president, my favorite president, uh, sang that off-key rendition of Amazing Grace. And yes, he was as off-key as they come, but we love it nonetheless. Um, and with all that being said, uh, we've been here before, but we've missed those moments. And so while I feel hopeful and faithful, we've missed those moments before. And I'm going to use an age-old uh, uh, adage, which is relevant today, um, political adage, which is trust but verify. So each day we go, I refuse to give out participa participation trophies. I'm going to trust but verify that we're moving in a direction of justice, truth, and peace. And so I'm just happy to be on a panel with people who are way smarter than me. And I look forward to learning as much as possible. So I want to stay with you for a minute because I think many people may not know that you attended Morehouse. Um, and of course, as you mentioned, your whoa, father. Whoa, whoa. Let, let me stop you right there. Yes. They know. You can always tell a Morehouse man. You just teach them. <laughs> <laughs> no, I appreciate it. Um, and of course, we know that Morehouse produced, as you mentioned, so many uh, iconic figures as, as Dr. Martin Luther King. And your father, who many of us have, have studied, uh, uh, Cleveland Sellers Jr., as you pointed out, who was not only a civil rights activist, but who um, also became president of, of Voorhees College, where education and the role of education was so important in your life. Um, what do you see um, as higher education's role and really grappling with some of these, these incidents that I mentioned earlier uh, on, where you're having almost on a daily basis these kind of horrific incidents and encounters between young African Americans and, and police? So I think that uh, these institutions of higher learning are where we cultivate the new activists and change agents of the future. Uh, I make no doubt that you're, the students on these campuses, they're not the leaders of the future. I think that's one of the most asinine statements ever. They're the leaders of today. Every ounce of change we've ever had has been because of young people who were a part of something larger than themselves. My father was a member of SNCC. Um, my parents, my, my grandparents, this is a, this, this is a, a bit of, a bit of irony, my grandparents wanted to, to get him out of the movement. So, you know where they sent him to school? They sent him to Howard University. Um, I don't know who wants to get their child out of the movement and, and sends them to Howard. <laughs> uh, but when he got to Howard, he befriended and was roommates with a man named Stokely Carmichael. And I got to whisper the name Stokely because I named my twin, one of my twins after Stokely and it's nap time. So unless you want Stokely to join us, I have to whisper <laughs> that. Um, and, you know, I just, I just think that our institutions of higher learning, whether or not it's Voorhees College, which is an 800 student liberal arts school in the big city of Denmark or Claflin, which I think is, is one of the most um, amazing institutions on the face of the earth, white, black, HBCU, PWI are indifferent, or whether or not it's Morehouse, Spelman, Hampton or Howard or, or, or Tougaloo or whatever it may be, we have to make sure that we're allowing these young people to dream with their eyes open. We have to make sure that we teach them the history of of the activism and, and make sure that they're change agents in whatever field they go in. This, this moment that we're in right now uh, means that our institutions of higher learning, right? 
have to allow their ministry, for lack of a better term, to go outside of their gates. Um, if you are confining your students to their gates, then you're doing them a disservice. They need to be making sure that they're impacting the community around them. And I, I am, uh, you know, this Generation Z is a phenomenal generation. Uh, they, they're they very, they're weird. They're, they're really weird. They listen to some weird music. I'm saying that I'm 35 years old. But just about two years ago, we were worried about them eating Tide Pods. I don't know if y'all remember when that was a fad. But now this generation is on the forefront of changing gun laws in this country, something I would never think would happen. It's a fascinating, fascinating generation to watch grow. And so, um, you know, I wrote, I wrote an entire book, uh, My Vanishing Country, on the impact of activism and being a change agent. And I am so um, grateful that my activism was able to be um, cultivated at, at, at Morehouse College. I tell a story in there briefly about Samuel L. Jackson. Many of y'all don't know Samuel was a rebel. Samuel not only was chosen to be a pallbearer for Dr. King, uh, it's only 1,300 of our closest friends, so I share this with you. I, I write about it, and it is what it is. Uh, but the next year, he got um, suspended. Um, he had, a, he had a, a year long suspension because Samuel L. Jackson held the board of trustees. One of the members on the board of trustees was none other than Dr. King's dad, held them hostage, um, literally, because he wanted to make sure that they were promoting activism and they had a student voice on their board of trustees. And so it's that type of culture, maybe not holding your board of trustees hostage, I'm not advocating, <laughs> but it's that culture of activism uh, that is important. Yeah, sure. yeah, absolutely. I want to go to Dr. Ford. Thank you, uh, Mr. Sellers. I want to go to you, Dr. Ford, because again, so much of what I think Mr. Sellers mentioned here is, is again, entrusting young people to, to be the leaders, right? To, to help to, 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 to lead um, these movements. But, but institutions are sometimes the problem, right? Institutions sometimes get in the way. So how do we deal with some of the kind of institutional barriers that exist at institutions. I'm thinking predominantly white institutions where, again, there's all this talk about, again, diversifying, achieving equity, but sometimes institutions themselves fall very short in terms of recruiting and retaining people of color, um, making sure that campuses are safe for black and brown students. So how do we grapple with that angle in terms of getting administrators and faculty to realize that we need to create these space, safe spaces for these students, as, as Bakari said, to lead. Um, well, thank you for having me on this panel and um, Dr. Watson just hosting this event. I have always been concerned that um, institutions of higher education, in particular the Ivory Tower, the predominantly white institutions have been very unfriendly, and that's keeping it mildly for minoritized people, and especially Blacks and Hispanics. Uh, I'm not trying to get into oppression Olympic, Olympics, but I mean for those two in particular, and all types of barriers um, exist then and now, and I think it is even, it's further tragedy upon tragedy that we have to have um, George Floyd's murder as one example, as the tipping point to get us to where we uh, have finally started talking more about this ongoing several hundred years racial and anti-black in particular pandemic. It's just not against it uh, is really mainly anti-Blacks. Um, but we have to work together as you have been doing in diverse issues and other um, uh, venues to make sure that we are preparing uh, minoritized people to be ready to not just survive in the academy, but to thrive in the academy. And that really means diversifying the academy. It means uh, taking on policies and procedures. It means fighting promotion and tenure uh, documents and policies and procedures. For example, it pains me, and uh, I try to be brief, 
but it pains me a great deal. And I just saw this this week when a black faculty publishes mainly in what's called urban journals, black journals, and then is penalized and told that those journals are not critical. They're not uh, held in high regard. They're not, et cetera. But then, damn it, where else can we publish? Real talk. So I talk about two personalities. I have Dr. Ford, who, who publishes in the mainstream journals. And I see you over there laughing, Dr. Bonner. But I got Dr. Ford, who has to try to be nice and publish in these white journals. And then I got Donna Ford from Cleveland is going to tell you like it is. And then that's when I can publish in your new journal, Dr. Bonner, and in others. So we have to make sure there are other venues. And that's not even all that I want to say, Dr. Watson. I'm, I'm saying um, we have to make, I, there's so much I want to say, but I mean, you know, we're just beginning, but there's so much I want to say. And um, because of my righteous indignation, my angry black scholar, my, I'm sick of caudacity. I, and I didn't say audacity. I said caudacity. I'm sick of scholarship. And yes, I said that. I'm sick of us being rejected for high quality work that these white journals won't let us in. I created, uh, co-created a group called Race Mentoring, Research Advocacy, Collabor uh, Research Advocacy Collaboration and Empowerment so that we can help Blacks and others thrive in the academy. That's, there's so much I want to say, but let me stop there. All right, I want to go to Dr. Bonner, because you've, you've taught at a predominantly white institution. You're now in a historically black college and university. Uh, your work in scholarship really focuses on, on quite, quite a number of research topics, including African-American males. I'm wondering, can you follow up on what Dr. Ford said, the kind of tension that exists often at our institutions, particularly around leadership? Absolutely. Um, I appreciate um, you pulling together this um, collection of thought leaders, Jamal. You're always a leader in, um, in getting us together to do some um, amazing things by way of our conversation about what's going on out there. I just really, really appreciate it. Appreciate it. So um, I would like to add a few thoughts. Um, one of the first things that I, um, um, and you're right, I've taught, um, I'm now at Prairie View A&M University, and this is my first experience in an HBCU not my first experience in a minority serving institution. I was actually first tenured at the University of Texas San Antonio, a Hispanic serving institution. So I have, um, but prior to that, Texas A&M, Bowling Green State University, Texas A&M University, and Rutgers University, where I served as the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Endowed Chair. But given my experiences and and my background and training, my degree is in higher administration and college teaching. So I've spent quite a bit of time not only looking at um, institutions from an academic perspective, but also my own emic perspective, having been in these institutions and seeing in real time what's going on and what has happened by way of our leadership and by way of uh, what we're dealing with, with some of the issues with structural racism and inequality and inequity. And as Dr. Ford says, you know, we have spent our careers talking about what it, what it means to um, get our institutions to a place of, uh, of a more equitable stance um, for black males, black females in particular, but really for all diverse populations. One of the things that I wanna say um, as a higher ed scholar, I look at institution after institution, particularly predominantly white institutions. Every predominantly white institution that I've um, professed in has conducted a climate study. And my thing is, we have, we have the data. You know, we all talk about these data-driven um, experiences that we should have. So we're, we're doing these data-driven experiences, but we get the data, but we do nothing with it. So I used to say, if I see another institution conducting a climate study, looking at race, and to do nothing about it, I say, you know, I'm just, I'm over it. I said, we have to move from climate study to climate action. You know, we have the data, we've conducted the studies, 
we know about the experiences of African American, of Hispanic, of Asian students, of even of poor white students, but what are we doing about it besides studying it? And as we look um, very deeply, um, in the field of student affairs, I teach courses in higher ed and student affairs. And in student affairs, there's, um, there's a theory, uh, it's called Lewin's Interactionist Paradigm. And I have my students to apply it to so many different contexts. What Lewin said, uh, he was a psychologist, he said that behavior is a function of the person times the environment. Mm. B equals F, P times E. And when you break it down, basically what he's saying is that any behavioral outcome that you get is based on the person, the people, and it's based on the environment. So if we really want to get these outcomes that are equitable, if we want to get these outcomes that are based on where everyone has a sense of esprit de corps and no one feels relegated and uh, sidelined because of their uh, race, ethnicity, orientation, we have to look at what are we doing in the environments? You know, you have the people. The people are who they are. Their identities are what they are. But the thing that we so overlook and we don't change is the environment. What are we doing to make an impact on the environment to get these behavioral outcomes we want? And that starts with the leadership. It starts with faculty. And uh, the last thing that I'll say is um, my um, work has centered on the experiences of academically gifted African-American males in post-secondary institutions. Because very early on, I wanted to move us beyond a deficit model and, to st and start to tell asset-based models, asset-based stories. And Dr. Ford was right there, has been right there at the very beginning of my, and across my career. And her work on telling a, dif a different narrative, telling assets, showing assets. So I was very unapologetic. You know, I started this work, you know, now we have a few people, more people than when I started doing work on black males. But when I started, there was no one doing any real, real work besides Dr. Ford on academically gifted black males in the post-secondary setting. And one of the first things I got, the pushback that I got is, wait, 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 wait. You know, what about the black males that are struggling? What about those who are having problems? What about those who are dropping out, stopping out? I was like, we have studied that, you know, infinite. We have got to look at, what about the brothers who are successful? What about the brothers? I want to know about that brother who's sitting in your class with a 99.9 .9 average, who comes from that side of the tracks, but despite all these obstacles, he's there and he's achieving. I'll stop there. Yeah, I want to go to Dr. Solomon Fernandez because in a recent op-ed for Diverse, you wrote, quote, higher education is often seen as the great equalizer, but we know that there are great disparities in success rates among different student groups. And I was wondering if you could elaborate on that a bit. Can you hear us? Absolutely. Uh, okay. Thank you so much for having me as part of this distinguished panel. And I will say that because I am in a rural area, um, I, yes, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear can you. You're hear breaking me? up a little bit, but go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Can everybody hear me? Yes, yes. we can hear you. Yes. Oh. Okay, fantastic. I'm in a rural area and everything was working just fine until the moment that we started. Um, oh, all right. It sounds like there may be a little delay. Well, let's, let's, let's circle um, back. Let's circle I back. Think, to uh, okay, fantastic. We'll circle back. What to I you. want to say is that, yes, we learn education as a great equalizer. Students start taking on some that and they are not able to we'll, we'll circle back to to dr solomon fernandez and we'll go back okay. to you we'll go back to you mr sellers because i know you have a hard stop in, in a few minutes because you have to do tv but i, I do want to get uh, a couple more questions in and the, the, the question that i have and i think some of the registrants who are on want to know is how do we forge better relationships between colleges and universities and the grassroots, the community really, um, to deal with some of these issues around inequities? Because there has to be this kind of partnership that takes place between um, institutions of higher learning and the activists on the ground. Can you talk to that? Yeah, I would suggest you pick up the phone. 
Um, you know, none of this is rocket science, right? Uh, the city that you're in, I, you know, I, I would do something and I always ask this question. I travel all around the country and speak at various different um, colleges and universities. Uh, I always say the first thing is you need to make sure you have a, pre a precinct if you're in my four and a half time Yorkie in the background. Make sure you have a precinct on your campus. You've got to have a precinct on your campus. And that is the, that is the most important thing. These dogs, this is what you get from working at home right now. I have a four and a half pound Yorkie. Come here, buddy. Come here, buddy. So make sure you have a precinct on your campus. Make sure you're engaged in your surrounding communities. Those are all very, very, very important things for you to do. Um, the other thing that you got to do, the other thing that you have to do is make sure that you are, are allowing your students to participate in local governments and, and around them. And, and what I mean by that is there's no reason why you're, you're not, you're teaching a, 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 or there's no reason why you shouldn't be teaching a civics or a government class and taking your, your students down to see the local city council or the local school board. I mean, hell, many of y'all probably got students that could run or should run for school board or the state house on their particular campuses. I mean, if you're a, if you're a university of, of 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 students, that means that you probably don't have a city council member that is a 18, 19, 20 year old student on your campus. You should be, you should be encouraging your young people to do that. You should be encouraging your young people to write more too. That's something that we do not do enough of. The old people, with all due respect, ain't the only ones who should be writing in scholarly journals. We should make sure that our young people are writing in those journals as well. Your students should get that opportunity to do so. Um, and a lot of times that grassroots activism, a lot of times these students end up becoming rooted in that particular community. You're, you're teaching those students right there. I, I ran for office when I was 20 years old. Um, I announced when I was 21 years old, I ran against somebody who was 82 years old I've been in office longer than I have been born. I went back home. I didn't run in Atlanta, although we had people from Atlanta to run in that Atlanta area. I went back home and ran um, and ran where I'm from. And in June 13, 2006, I became the youngest black elected official in the, in the United States of America at the age of 21 years old. Like that's not, but that's not, that's not like weird. That's not atypical. There are many students on these particular and respective campuses that can do the same thing. We just have to empower them. That, that's my only thing. We have to empower them. And another thing that we don't do a good job of, you, you talk about activism and you talk about working with your local communities is we don't set a level of expectation. Um, as, as I believe it was Dr. Bonner was talking about, you know, young black men who do well from that side of the tracks. Uh, I think our greatest failure in our institutions of higher learning is we become pretty um, mundane in our, in our dreaming and we don't, we do not, um, we don't set a level of expectation. We don't place a crown above these kids' heads for them to grow into. Well said. Thank you so much for, for joining us. I know you've got to run, but again, I would encourage everyone to get My Vanishing Country, a memoir. Uh, it's just a fascinating book um, about your life and your work and the ways in which you've been able to speak to these issues of inequity. For, well, for let, me, let me just years. say, let me say thank you to you, Dr. Watson. And let me also say thank you to everyone who supported this is a this is a this is um not a plug but this is very kind of weird I, i'm very happy the book's doing well and the reason being is not for me but uh i really want other young people of color to have an opportunity to write and share their stories and unless we do well and unless we support each other then those doors are closed and so i'm grateful um that it's doing well so that others will get that opportunity to go out and share their stories as well and Dr. Ford, you're a bad woman. I love you. I'm, I'm, I'm about to start Googling and learning more. Boy, you better, Dr. Watson, you need to send me something. Let me know who I'm on the panel with next time. <laughs> All right. Well, y'all have fun. Good. Thank you so All much. Right. Appreciate yeah. you. All right. Yeah, Bye -bye. Your book too. Thank you. Thank you. I, I want to go to Dr. Southern because you, uh, you recently wrote an op-ed titled Pledging to Disrupt Systemic Racism in Higher Education uh, Advocacy. And you talked about steps that you were going to take to personally disrupt systemic racism as a white male. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that personal pledge that you made. Sure, and uh, as the speaker said, thanks so much for having me uh, here today. And it's just a real honor to, to be with uh, everyone and particularly for um, Dr. Ford, who as a former teacher of mine, I know both Donna Ford. So uh, that's been really important for me to develop um, as an advocate and as a scholar. So uh, it's a real privilege to be with you. 
Um, in that piece in particular, uh, as I think some other uh, folks have alluded to, um, I find myself, I say, writing angry a, a lot uh, when I see, of course, what's happening in the world. And so sometimes you have to let that be your outlet. And then you wake up in the morning and you say, well, how do I kind of get this to a place where I would where I would share it? And I would say that, as I believe um, Mr. Sellers mentioned, a lot of this stuff isn't isn't rocket science. And as Dr. Bonner mentioned, um, you know, we have the data. Um, and I kept seeing a lot of well-intentioned people who were inviting me to reading groups and discussion groups to talk about um, white privilege and the role of, of white folks, uh, particularly in higher education um, and in society. Um, and as I said in the piece, that's, that's well and good and those things are, are needed to deepen understanding. Um, but we have to also take action with that knowledge. Um, and so I, did, I just sort of did some thinking about well, what are some tangible things that I can personally commit to and hopefully um, that can prompt some of my colleagues to make some personally meaningful commitments of their own. You know, not everyone's in the same position. Um, not everyone has the same role or, or, or um, has been involved in these issues for the same amount of time. So what I kind of laid out was uh, first, um, you know, seeing a lot of events about educational equity that were only featuring uh, white people and white speakers. And the thing that prompted me to write that piece was getting invited to, I think, like the fourth panel of all white speakers on the effects of COVID-19 and higher education. And I just said, well, how in the world can you have this conversation um, with, uh, without folks from communities of color that are the most impacted um, by COVID-19? Uh, I cited some data from Pew that found that 13% of Americans are, are, are Black or African American, but 24% of the deaths uh, are in that uh, community. Um, when we think about inequities in higher education, as previous speakers have all noted, we've known for a long time how those play out. So I hear a lot of people saying, well, what, what can I do? And so I said, well, as a starting place, don't take that seat. You know, ask the question, like, how are you planning to have this conversation uh, with people who are not from the community most affected? Um, if you are called to, to speak on an issue in higher education about equity, how can you, as a, as a white person, make sure that the reporter is aware that there are voices other than your own, perspectives other than your own um, that are at play? This plays out in your own um, organization as well. You know, I'm someone who believes that you can't work on equity externally unless you practice it internally. And so I just tried to articulate a commitment there and, and to make everyone aware in my own organization, which I think, I hope they are, um, that when we move into hiring processes, we talk about our institutional culture and our own values that we're foregrounding um, considerations for low-income people, people of color, those who've been marginalized the most uh, in our society. And then beyond that, um, as just a person um, living in America, blessed with some means, how do you invest in the communities that are important to you? How do you direct uh, resources into minority-owned businesses and nonprofit organizations that are um, supporting communities. Um, I chose to say that I would um, at least once a week uh, make an investment in a business or a nonprofit, um, either in my hometown um, or in other cities and places where I've, I've lived and, and known as home, including here in DC. Um, those don't have to be big commitments, but over time you find that um, those investments accrue and it's also a tangible way that you can know that you're investing in your community and, and really importantly in, in the future of, of our country and of our neighbors. So that's just kind of how I was, I was thinking about the moment, um, driven in part by, I mean, we're all on text threads these days and we see these invitations, these events, and everybody's texting and saying like, oh, isn't this an interesting panel to have this conversation? But I just, I felt compelled, like someone should sort of step out and, and say that that's going on and try to disrupt that and say, this is, this, is, this might be normative, but it, um, it's something that needs to be worked against and uh, actively called out and subverted. That, that's interesting because we see a lot and we hear a lot about white people talking about wanting to be allies, uh, wanting to support uh, people of color. And I think you've provided a, a very concrete way that that can be done um, as well. Um, so, so that's very, very interesting. Dr. Uh, Watson, if yes, you want to say something. Yes, please. So thank you, um, Dr. Southern. Um, you really have uh, touched upon some things that's really been on my heart and soul for a long time, but uh, escalated 
and um, more emphasized in clearly the recent uh, weeks and months. Uh, so what, I, what I'm seeing now, and it is so unfortunate, is institutions of higher education as well as organizations posting these hollow anti-racist statements that make me want to vomit. I mean, that really anger me, that are so superficial, that are so contradictory to their pre previous actions and, you know, really contemporary actions. And it's like jumping on the bandwagon. So instead of just, as you said, you want to do, you know, complain, which we must complain. I'm saying I want um, leaders in the academy, but also P to 12, to um, stop giving lip service to equity and to hire people who know about equity work. And yes, that includes non, uh, that includes whites and other, you know, non, say non-blacks. But hire, hire le leaders and people who know what they're doing and who have shown that they can have impact. Diversify. I mean, this ethnic matching, as um, Donald Easton Brooks uses that term, coined that term, I believe it is, is real. Make these policies and procedures be actionable. Live up to them. Hold your faculty accountable when they are racist and discriminatory. Same with staff. Make sure that students know they are coming to an institution where racism is not acceptable. And I don't like the word tolerated. I tolerate a fly as, I tolerate a fly. I see one, I mean, anyway, let me slow down. But you tolerate fly, flies at a, at a picnic, all right? I'm trying to be nice right now. I don't like the word, the word tolerate. But you let students know that they will be, what kind of institution they're coming to where you are not going to exercise any form of racism in word and deed. And if you do, there will be consequences. I just have to say this and I'll stop. I follow FBI hate crimes every year. And every year when those reports come out, it's, it's around 7,000 hate crimes. And you know, those are the most heinous, the most vile, but they're also the ones that reported and we don't know how many more weren't reported. Now that said, out of the 7,000 that usually come out for the most vile hate crimes and the majority are based on race, one, second, they're against Blacks, too. And then the second most place for hate crimes are in academic institutions. Mm -hmm. And that is higher education and P to 12. So this panel, this topic that you've put together is crucial. And I, you, you might need part two, hint, hint, Dr. Watson. Because there's so much to say, but it's crucial because the racism, especially anti-Black, is out of control with professors, with administrators, with classmates, with the police force, with the, with the staff, with you name it. Mm -hmm. And yes, it can be addressed. It must be addressed and i'll stop yeah, and that's interesting because i think institutions often set themselves as again progressive spaces um, where they have the response to it when in fact um there may be problems internally and often are problems internally that that go unaddressed you know i recently seen dr bonner uh, a report that said that enrollment in hbcus is beginning to climb in part because a lot of black students don't want to deal with a lot of this racist foolishness at uh, white institutions or their parents are saying 
we're not sending you to predominantly white institutions where you might be harassed by the police, or as Dr. Ford mentioned, you may have a racist instructor um, who, you know, who challenges kind of your dreams and aspirations. So can you talk to that? Um, you know, are you hearing that as well and seeing that as well? I am and absolutely seeing it. And um, one of the things that I want to say that uh, kind of dovetails with what uh, Dr. Ford says, I mean, she's doing amazing work and uh, forging new boundary, pushing uh, across um, new uh, landscapes to really do some important things. But what I'm seeing, um, one thing that I think, and one reason I think this is happening is that for people of color, Jamal, you know, I shared with you in a, um, um, an article that I did some time ago looking at um, uh, who owns blackness. And that is one of the most pervasive things that I think we have to uh, look at and think about. You know, gone are the times, particularly coming out of, um, coming out of these or working with these, pandemics. I mean, the pandemic of race, um, uh, of course, COVID. But one of the things, um, I'm working on a piece right now where um, I really want to look at, you know, how we exit, you know, when and how we exit um, these pandemics. And one thing that we have to look at is we must stop outsourcing Blackness. We have to have dominion over our own narrative. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that, you know, we have wonderful scholars. Uh, we have people like Dr. Southern, uh, white scholars, um, my good colleague, Daniel Hartlip, um, Asian American. He uh, is doing good work. He looks at um, uh, African American populations, black populations. But gone is the time that we allow individuals outside of the black diaspora to have dominion over our narrative. I didn't say an opinion about our narrative. I said dominion over our narrative. You know, we should be telling the stories about historically black colleges and universities. We should be telling the stories about black male identity. We should be telling the stories about black girl magic. So gone are the times for allowing individuals outside of the black diaspora to have dominion, not an opinion, dominion over our narrative. And when I was just talking to my uh, BFF, uh, Dr. Aretha Marbley at Texas Tech University, and we've been uh, good friends since our days in the doctoral program at the University of Arkansas. And she says, you know, she said, Bonnie, you told me something way back when I started as a um, professor at Texas Tech. Um, she said, I was very, she said, remember that time I was very, very upset when I left the uh, faculty meeting. Uh, we, uh, I worked with colleagues and we had really hashed out this um, really important issue related to tenure and promotion. And then um, I saw a colleague there at uh, the grocery store and I was like, hey, and I ran up and the colleague was kind of like, um, hi. And she said, and that so crushed me. She said, remember what you said to me? I said, I absolutely do. I said, my dear, you have confused political and personal allies. There are so many times that we as people of color, we think it all transcends, you know, if we're friends in a battle professionally, then we're friends in a battle socially. That is not always the case. So we really have to look at um, holistically what that means for our institutions, for our HBCUs. So I don't think it, um, it's not surprising to me that parents are telling their kids and that there's an influx of people going into HBCUs because we don't have to worry about those boundaries and those separations as much. We, you know, we can just be ourselves. We can live in our identities. We can walk around in these black bodies and these shells and be okay. And I think these campuses give us an opportunity to do that. And they give us an opportunity to share and tell our own narratives in authentic ways. You know, to me, you know, talking about an HBCU and theorizing about an HBCU, but being in the HBCU context and coming from family and traditions. I mean, I had a grandmother. I had a father. I had a mother. My parents, uh, they graduated with their master's the same day from Prairie View A&M University. So although I spent all of my time, I, um, all my background and training was in PWIs and all of my work experiences until Prairie View were in PWIs. However, I had this basis for HBCUs that came from my family lineage. But now I can really speak from my authentic perspective because I'm in an HBCU. So I'm not just theorizing about HBCUs. I'm actually in that HBCU context. Yeah. 
think that's what parents and that's what people see is that we want the authenticity. We want to know that it's not just um, coming from a pen, coming from my head as an academic exercise. It's coming from a place of authenticity. And I can go and be in a place that allows me to just be me. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I you just know, want to say this. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Dr. No, go ahead. I've never attended an HBCU, and I regret it um, because it didn't give me certain experiences. But um, I also want to say that I don't want our Black families and other minoritized groups to just think they can just run from PWIs. I mean, we live in the real world, and it's predominantly white. So with that in mind, um, we've got to prepare our students to um, not just cope. So I'm going to use the word uh, thrive and not just survive, but, but uh, uh, thrive in whatever institution of higher learning they attend. No. Um, there, there are issues in the black uh, universities, HBCUs, mind you, and in some of them, the, many of the students are white. Let's keep that uh, mm -hmm. up there. And being taught by white faculty. So even though it may not be predominantly white, we got to look at who's, um, who's teaching yeah. and things like that. But let's not run from racism because it's going nowhere. Let's prepare, our, our, let's, let's just get prepared um, to address it. And there are ways to do that. And for me, um, if you are in the academy as a, so it depends on what angle, but um, let me just go with faculty. You're in, a, you're in a faculty position. If you know what the minimum publication requirements are, you have to exceed it. You have to exceed it. Um, you have to collect data that indicate why your teaching evaluations are lower than your white colleagues, because they will be. I mean, mm -hmm. that's just a given. And you have to make sure that you are advising students. You have to make sure that you're involved in service and leadership positions. And I hate this saying. So for some, it motivates. For others, it does not. But in the Black community, which is, 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 um, is not monolithic, you know, is not um, homogenous, you know, we are um, heterogeneous. But I'm going to just say this. We usually, many of us are taught, if you are Black, you got to work twice or three times harder than whites, and you may get half as far. So what I'm saying is, you've got to double your efforts. And if you are not, if you can't do it alone, you call on Dr. Bonner, you call on Dr. Southern, you call on others to collaborate with you to make sure you get published. And I'm just saying that only from a faculty perspective, and that's very brief. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a good point. You know, I've been thinking a lot about um, after these incidents, uh, more recent incidents have happened and, and, and have gotten a lot of coverage um, that we've seen a lot of corporations, uh, foundations donating a large amount of money to certain causes. Do Dr. Southern, I wanted to go to you. I'm curious to know what you all make of that because, you know, Dr. Ford, I hear about the statements and, and feeling concerned that some of the statements put out by the university are are empty. And I'm just curious to know, what do you all make about this new wave of philanthropic dollars that are being um, pushed out after these incidents? I'll go to you, uh, Dr. Southern. Yeah, um, thanks for that question. And I'll, I'll, I'll first just kind of pick up on, on Dr. Ford's point. I wanted to mention a great resource that just came out from Dr. Kimberly Griffin at the University of Maryland. She had a really comprehensive look at the whole literature that Dr. Ford uh, just alluding to of course, there's decades of research around questions about um, the inhospitability of predominantly white institutions for faculty and students of color. Um, but I think it's a, it's a great summary, a great starting place if you wanna come into that conversation um, and also provide some tangible ways for institutional leaders to think about hopefully making progress. Um, in terms of these investments from philanthropy and the 
let's call it the great awakening of institutional leadership and um, corporate leaders as well. Um, you know, I think there's been um, a real need uh, for that. And you can, it's, it's one thing to put out a statement. It's one thing to establish um, a Center for Black Cultural Studies uh, on your campus. Um, it's another to have um, an African American Studies department. But until you devote tenure line uh, positions uh, to those uh, tracks, until you uh, have real um, dollars allocated to sustaining those programs, um, in my view, it's not really real. Um, and I would just say that um, if you look at a different issue, I'm just mindful of um, the DACA decision that came out from the Supreme Court uh, yesterday. You've seen a lot of institutions, um, so since DACA has come out, um, opening up new opportunities for DACA students. You've seen some states offered in state tuition. You've seen the growth of some undocumented student programs on campuses. Um, but on the whole, those can't be supported by public dollars. And so philanthropy has played a really critical role in making those uh, programs possible. And so I think I would love to see more of an opportunity um, for folks to uh, connect those narratives around marginalization of African American and Black students and faculty and our uh, immigrant populations on campuses. Um, I'm thinking about um, work by uh, Dr. William Lopez at the University of Michigan School of Public Health, who's written a great book called Separated, which really unites the narratives around police brutality in African American com communities and the deportation uh, of immigrant communities. Um, these are all part of the same narrative. And so to the extent that funders and institutional leaders can invest in programs and tangible ways to um, increase awareness and importantly, commitment to action of, of students, other folks on their campuses, I think that's a great use um, of dollars, uh, particularly for the future of the academy, but also the future of society. Yeah. Anyone else want to weigh in on this philanthropy question? And then I want to welcome back Dr. Solomon Fernandez. I want to get to you as well. Go ahead, Dr. Bonner, did you want to weigh in? I just want to say just a very quick thing. Um, and I, um, Dr. Southern, appreciate all the things you're doing and your comments. Uh, one thing that I want to say, I can remember when I was um, an ACE fellow, um, one of the speakers we had was Dr. Hughes, and they were going through um, uh, Katrina at the time. And she talked about how she was given all, given all this money, but uh, the lesson that she um, wanted to impart on us who were aspiring college presidents is that she said, I said to them, you know, you're giving me this money, but you're not going to tell me how I should use it. So that's what we have to do. When we get these uh, funds, uh, when we have our foundations, when we have giving these philanthropic efforts, we have to, uh, again, have dominion over the narrative about how we spend them and what it should be spent for. So we have to make those conscious decisions that come from a place of authenticity where we know what's going to be best for our black and brown communities. So we have to use those dollars, use them in ways that are effective that we uh, find to be effective. Yeah, thank you. I want to go down to uh, Dr. Solomon Fernandez. Thank you for uh, joining us. Again, talk a little bit about the disparities that we talked about earlier. You got unfortunately disconnected. Yes, I'm so sorry about that. We we live in a rural area, and um, despite our best efforts today, the internet access is variable. So this goes to show the dis some of the disparities that we deal with um, being in different areas. I think what I want to add to the conversation is that um, part of what we're seeing is that, yes, we have students of color who are entering higher education at very high rates, but when we think of higher education as, be as being the great equalizer, we have to ask ourselves, do these students have the social capital to be able to get out and have higher education and make a measurable difference in their lives, both qualitatively and quantitatively? One of the things that we continue to see is that um, the levels of wealth of people of color in the US, um, when you look at uh, white versus everyone else, and when we look at white versus um, black uh, families, you see a huge disparity. For every hundred dollars that a uh, white family has, a black family has five dollars and four cents. So to me, that is statistically insignificant from zero, right? When you're looking at five dollars versus zero dollars, it's next to nothing. And as we are going through this pandemic, part of what we are seeing also is that the families that are most adversely impacted, the populations that are most adversely impacted by what 
what's going on right now are um, people of color, people of color, people who are 50 and over and women. So when you look at the intersectionality, these things are being exacerbated. The, the um, uh, challenges that we're going on right now are being exacerbated. Um, and we need to be particularly uh, uh, sensitive to that. And then the other thing that I also wanted to mention is that role models matter, right? Who the students see in the classroom, who they see in the hallways, who they see as um, administrators, as influential people in their lives matter. And I think in higher ed, we have this tendency to intellectualize everything, right? And we're not looking at, well, how are we treating our, um, our faculty and staff of color? Are we validating their research? Are we allowing them to move through tenure so that they can be here? The work itself, the very, um, uh, uh, their very existence within higher ed is a laborious, overwhelming undertaking. So when you have research that a lot of people of color and women we know from the empirical evidence tend to take, it's around participatory action research. It is um, research that is going to make a qualitative difference in their communities. So when we don't acknowledge them, when we tell them that this is not valid, that it's not real research, that it's not lab research, um, what we are essentially doing is saying, it's okay, we welcome you in, but you really don't belong. And then for our students, they also have no role models. They don't have people with whom they can talk, they can confide and talk about the challenges um, that they're experiencing. So I think it's an opportunity for us right now to look at what are the ways in which we are creating pipelines, we are supporting people adequately with the resources that we give them, because we also know that there is disparate level of resources that we give um, to faculty of color, to women, that um, prevent them from being able to move up and succeed. Um, so how do we help them so that our students can see um, that they have help? Um, and also looking at um, uh, the qualitative experiences that people are having. I think we have, we have a tendency to have a solely data approach that is very reductionist, that's very sanitized, but we don't talk about the experiences. And to the um, comment that was made before about campus climate studies, what are we using those for? And are we developing the levels of cultural dexterity on our campuses so that when we do bring people of color on campus so that they can succeed, so that they can thrive? Is the organization ready to have um, people of color? Because I think nothing is worse than inviting someone of color to come onto your campus to disrupt their career and only for them to find that um, they can't succeed. So it's actually doing more harm than if they had stayed where they had been before. Um, so there are so many issues here. Um, and uh, I thank my colleagues for all of the comments that have been brought up. And I want to jump right. I'm go always ahead, interrupting you, Dr. Wise. No, 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 go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> so I, I, wanna, I wanna jump on that. And I wanna make sure that we are disaggregating um, the, the data. So um, when we talk about cl uh, climate on campuses or anywhere, it's just not about women. What is it for black women? What is it for Asian women? What is it for, and even break it down, Mexican women versus whatever. So, you know, going back to intersectionality, my life as a, so when I face discrimination, I wanna be clear. The first thing that comes to mind is because I'm black, not because I'm a woman. And then is secondarily, it might be because I'm a woman and that's on or off campus. So, this, you know, this white feminism does not work for me or for many of us. And hence we have other, you know, theories um, out, loud, out there. I also want to say that, like when I, inter when, um, I interview for positions, let me just say that, I am, I am bold and I just put it out there that I am angry you should be angry, shame on you if you're not. And we need leaders who are um, upfront about that. And yes, I'm gonna give kudos to my Dean, Hope Davis, who probably has hired more blacks in the most recent year and a half, going on two years than anyone else. And he set it up front, he's lived up to it, and he's doing it. So if you go into a position and you're trying to pretend to be something you're not and you, are, you don't speak up, you're gonna regret it later. So just go on and jump out the box and say who you are now. 
<laughs> so, is that, you know, so like if, you know, like if you're in a relationship, like if you just meet somebody and you're dating, I'm in with this analogy, and you try to pretend like you don't do this, you don't do that, and then you start dating and you start doing things you say you didn't do, they're going to be like, oh, I thought you didn't smoke. Oh, I thought you didn't. Oh, I thought you didn't. See, you're a liar and it's not going to work. Just tell them up front. I'm angry. I'm black. I'm pissed off. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. That's it. All right. We Can I just say something, Dr. Watson? <laughs> yes, go ahead. Go ahead. I, think, I think one of the things that I, I you know, taking that, those comments um, uh, from Dr. Ford, I like to think about our students' experiences, right? Because they have this relationship of power with us. And I think acknowledging that our students of color, regardless of their race, but also especially because of their race, um, and whether they are black versus Hispanic and whether they are males, because we know the research also tells us that they have differential experiences. Um, how do we in the classroom acknowledge and celebrate who they are and also understand that we have students, their prior experiences with in the academic realm may not have been positive. And we also have students who have come, they were number one in their classes and they're coming into our environments where they're encountering challenges. So it's incumbent upon us in the classroom and also outside of the classroom to say, how can we go outside of our way to be color, to be color conscious, to recognize that we don't want to treat these students the same, to recognize that we need to go above and beyond to say, I know, or I have a sense of your what exper your experiences have been, or tell me more about what your experiences have been so that we can encourage you to come and talk to your faculty member because we know students with social capital, they feel entitled to some of these services, but our students of color, it's damaging. It helps their sense of self-esteem to go and ask for help, to feel like they are, um, that they may be less than. So there are so many things here, um, but I just wanted to look at it from the student perspective. No, that's, that's important. Let, let's get to some questions because we've got a lot. And one of the recurring Dr. questions- Dr. Can, can I jump in just one quick point before we do that? Yeah, and then I'm gonna go to questions. Go ahead. Yeah, great. I just wanted to, to acknowledge um, Dr. Solomon Fernandez. And, and one point I wanted to make is that um, it's so critical in terms of the sort of guiding question here, like what's the role of higher education in disrupting racism and systemic inequity in society. I think we're thirsty for more uh, public leadership from our university and college presidents. And so to, to hear the voice of some a college leader um, like that on these issues um, is really critical, I think, to frame the narrative and hopefully to get the attention of, of policymakers of society. Um, I think that the, the compulsion to fundraise and to manage all the other things that college presidents have to do diminishes the time that they have available for that. But I'm, I'm hoping that in this moment we can shift back to a period where we hear the voices of higher education leaders who are pushing our society to confront these challenges. So I just appreciate her being here and, and hope that it inspires others to, to do the same. Yeah, and I think as Dr. Ford also said, the challenge for some leaders uh, and, and we're grateful that Dr. Solomon Fernandez is leading the way. But for some leaders, they're afraid and they're scared um, to be able to be bold. And on at times of uncertainty, you need that leadership, really for students, but also for faculty and staff, right, to be able to say, this is an issue that is important, and I'm not backing down from this. I think it's really, really critical. Let's go to a question. One question is, how do we deal with the issue of campus police um, in security, we've seen the rash of incidents uh, where, again, black students, black brown students were being called, uh, police were being called on them, uh, sleeping in dormitories, in the cafeteria, all of that stuff. Um, do you all have any ideas on, on how to, to grapple with improving those relationships between uh, campus police and, and the minor, minoritized community? Well, I think some of the um, reforms and we don't just need a reform; we need a revolution um, with the, what you know, with this, with, with, with what's going on with um, uh, police brutality. Um, socially, needs to be studied and um, implemented on campuses as well, uh, because um, we're seeing the same the same things happen. And you don't just see it with students; you see it with faculty. Um, you walk on campus as a faculty and wonder, um, a black faculty or faculty of color, or you look like a black faculty and you wonder if you're going to be, um, uh, stopped. 
and you always want to have your I, um, ID handy to, you know, to show. So look at those reforms and implement those. When I was at um, Vanderbilt, there were, um, I had the police chief and the second in command, I don't know the titles, but the police chief, the second in command, and a few of the officers come to my class and talk to students because I was so upset about these ongoing text messages um, about uh, a crime on campus. And as always, as a black male, like every damn black male is six feet tall and a hundred and what, 90 pounds, Dr. Bonner. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. You could be five feet and black and they think, never mind, I ain't gonna curse. But anyway, you could be five feet in black and they think you six feet. And I had them come on campus and I don't recall what those codes are for when you're, a, um, you know, police, uh, you know, for policing, not policing, but police on campus. And I had them explain that to my students and calm them down and explain why the text message was worded the way it was worded, et cetera. So bring the police into your classroom. Mm. Mm. And um, that can help some misunderstanding. It, and that, you know, and it doesn't have to be, um, and that was a black police chief, by the way. So I'm saying, you know, I'm thinking about the blue code and the black code and all these other kinds of things, but br bring them on campus, bring them, I'm mean, not on campus, bring them into your class. Yeah. Give students an opportunity to ask questions hold a forum on campus with the police so that even faculty understand what's going on. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a good suggestion. Let's go to another question. My community oh, college- One thing on that. Uh, okay, Dr. go ahead. Austin, the, this is not my, not my area, but just to, to pick up on the, the theme of, of, of DACA students earlier, I think it's also important for campus police to not serve as immigration agents. Mm -hmm. And to blur the lines there, I see campus police as, uh, first having a charge to protect their students. So like if, if someone is 19 or 20 and has a beer, I don't believe that should trigger a deportation hearing for that student. So how do you intervene and, and uphold your mission, but also make sure you're protecting your students from what can often be a, a really um, harmful environment for a lot of your students well beyond the campus? Great, here's a question. My community college wants to do more to teach our students to look at their biases and assumptions and be involved in making our community better but we need strategies to prepare the faculty for this work. Do you have any suggestions? I would say you need to just confront the work. I have to say one of the things that I'm really proud of, my community college um, where the vast majority of our faculty and staff are white, um, when we've been having these sessions in response to uh, uh, the recent events, people said, I want to be held accountable. I want to see my data. I want to understand how in the last three years, students of color in my class have fared. And I want to know what I can do differently. And I want the institution to give me the resources. I want you to understand that I can be wrong and I can fail. And what we're also seeing is students coming out and saying, you know, our faculty and staff do not reflect the world that we're going to go into. They don't reflect, if we don't have people of color to help us get the experiences of working with other, um, with patients of color, especially in the health sciences, how are we to know how to act beyond the intellectual aspect of what we are doing, beyond the theory, how do we put that into practice? So I think first it's cultivating the idea that um, there is personal responsibility, right? Let's stop, let's stop intellectualizing and start individualizing and operationalizing what do we what are the structures that we need to have in place and how do our policies someone had said that before if we examine them from the perspective of equity how do they either perpetuate or um, dismantle structural racism and i think part of it also is for us as leaders to put our money where to put our uh our money where our mouth is so one of the things that we did was to say um, to, to say, give us a plan, give us a, give us a diversity, equity, and inclusion strategic plan. And then for us to say, here are the resources that we are going to devote to that. 
because it doesn't matter what your composition is as an institution. What we know is that our country is becoming a plural nation. So we are going to have more students of color. In the world, we have so many majority minority cities. And I know some folks don't like that term, but how do we prepare our students to live in this world? And many of our students are younger and the younger generation, they espouse different values and they want action. So the talk, the fancy um, proclamations that we put out around our values, um, to them, they will tolerate it only so much. And they will say, what are the actions? And I think it's upon us to say, what can I do as opposed to blaming the institution? But in each of our role, how do we perpetuate or how do we work against these things? Yeah, a follow-up question for you, just let me get to the follow-up, is around the question of um, hiring. Um, and we have a question from someone who says, they're in a rural area, it's hard to get people of color. You're, you're in that situation. I was wondering, could you speak to that? Are you having, is it, is it a challenge? And if so, how do you address that? Yes, it is challenging. And again, I have to say, I want to laud, laud my faculty. Last year we did a search and it came out and they said back to me, again, this is all faculty of color. I mean, all, all white faculty, they said, we are going to call this a failed search because we want more diverse perspectives and we did not get the candidates that we want. So again, I think it's um, having those, living those espoused values. And now what it's telling us is we need to put more effort into getting um, people, into getting candidates of color because they are out there. And there is a lot of research that says, if you're going to move someone from their environments into a new environment and take that risk to come into an all white environment, and I can tell you how difficult it is for me. I know what it's like to live in an environment where it's 1% black, with 8% people of color. It is difficult. Um, and I think also creating affinity groups. So part of what we're doing is having specific sessions with students, uh, with students of color, faculty of color, and also with our criminal justice faculty and students to say, okay, these things are not dichotomies. You know, it's not either you support Black Lives Matter and, and dismantling racism, um, or uh, uh, you have no appreciation for the folks who are putting their, their lives in den danger, um, uh, who are willing to do that um, for our benefit. So I think to your question, what it means is asking what are the values and how are we living the values and how are we asking the folks we have on campus who are in color, of color what their experiences are because would they encourage a person of color to come here or would they say no? Um, yeah. And that and engaging them in the recruitment is really important. And to be able to do that, it ha you have to be credible and your institution have to have um, the record of doing the right thing. And you can't advertise in the same places that you've always advertised. You've got to go out of your network. I always get frustrated when, when I hear from presidents and say, who say, you know, we're, we're advertising. And I say, well, where are you advertising? Are you advertising in diverse issues in higher education? Are you, are, are you advertising and recruiting at historically black colleges and universities? We've got to push people. And this is the pushback I think Dr. Ford was talking about, where you have to say, we have to expand. You have to expand your network. You can't keep doing the same things over and expecting different kinds of results. Dr. Exactly. Ford, you want to jump in? I'm going to go to Dr. Bonner. Yeah, I I wanted to, um, yeah, thank you. I wanted to go and talk about um, like what, what also needs to be done, especially in terms of like um, curriculum. And um, I believe in the notion of no pain, no gain, other than when it comes to exercising. <laughs> I know you just bought a, <laughs> I know you just bought a bike, Dr. Bonner, but I'm not doing that. Okay, but uh, so... But anyway, no pain, no gain. So the pedagogy of discomfort, and I'm not, I don't have time to play with white fragility. I don't have time to play with white women's tears. You are going to, whether you like it or not, encounter black students and other minoritized students, um, those who live in poverty and those who don't. I'm doing the best I can to prepare you to be successful. So you can either go through it now and learn how to do it, or you can go through it later and wish you had taken my class or somebody else's class and listen and learn. But, um, we need to prevent this burnout um, among teachers, especially in urban settings. And that's because leaders did not require students to take diversity classes. 
leaders did not um, require, uh, did not do audits of classes. I mean, all of their classes, you know, all of their classes need to, and I'm not trying to uh, step on, you know, like faculty privilege and things like that, but I want to know what you're doing in what ever class you're teaching. I'm talking about engineering, the medical profession, whatever it is. I want to know what you're doing to prepare your future professionals to be anti-racist. I used to say culturally competent until probably the last couple of weeks. I'm changing that to anti-racist and to stop being anti-black. Culturally competent is diluting it. So all my 300 and some articles where I might say, or publications where I've said culturally competent, they still good y'all. But I'm just saying, <laughs> I, I, now they're gonna be saying anti-racist, okay? They're still relevant. Just wipe out culturally competent and, and put that there. But we are not trying to hurt you by, um, um, by helping you to be uh, anti-racist. We're really trying to help you and in helping you we help whomever your audience is. When I go to a doctor, I want them to know something about black people. When I go to a dermatologist, I want them to know something about my black skin. When I go to et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't care what the profession is. Mm -hmm. I am saying I want to I want to feel like you know something about me. You don't have to be an expert in every culture, but you can certainly try to learn about it. You need to learn about our ports as, as um, I published in um, Diverse Issues, our, perks, um, our ports, I'm sorry, their degrees of prejudice. You need to know about Merton's um, typology. You need to know about white privilege. You need to know about white fragility. You need to know about Hofstede's model. We need to get beyond, and I'm gonna stop. I'm sick and tired of talking about it implicit bias is we want to make me pull out what a little hair i have here explicit is is both but you letting people off the hook when you talk about ex implicit bias let's also talk about explicit and then more but the pedagogy of discomfort so yeah. we can help you now so you don't regret it later. And so I'll go back to Dr. Southern. Um, I did some of that, I hope, in when you were in classes with me. I, mm -hmm. I didn't want you to regret your degree from Vanderbilt or any class you or anybody else had with me. Yeah. Dr. Bowman. Yes, sir. I think um, drawing on um, our, our great scholars and our friends in, um, in counseling, um, there's such a uh, connection with uh, counseling and um, the field of student affairs. So um, some of the courses that I've taught, one course I um, uh, pretty routinely teach is uh, multicultural issues in uh, higher education. And yes, I still teach multicultural issues, um, even though I'm in the HBCU context. So it doesn't go away because you're in a HBCU environment. So one of the uh, activities that I have my students to engage in, and I mainly teach doctoral students and um, I really listen to what they say of what's valuable. You know, I'm like, you know, you're too far in the game. You're doctoral students. So I don't want you just to be taking classes and wasting your time. You know, it's not about the classes. It's about the knowledge because you're about to go out and go forth and do great things. So, so one of the assignments that I gave them um, this year, and it goes back to this old, older book that I use, but I really like, I still like the assignment. It's called Multicultural Action Planning. And um, it's an old book um, back from the uh, 90s. But anyway, this activity called Action Planning it really forces them to go out and put and operationalize their multicultural um, plans, their multicultural ideas, and put them in action and to learn about people in real, real time. And at the core of that particular activity, it comes from the counseling profession, where counseling, they base a lot of their work around these three pillars, knowledge, uh, attitudes, and skills. And if you go back and look at one of the seminal studies, you found that folks felt like, oh, oh, I read a lot about Black people. I read a lot about Hispanics. I read a lot about LGBTQ. So I know a lot. I'm knowledgeable. You know, many times they weren't knowledgeable, but everybody felt really good about their knowledge. Oh, I, I know. And then attitudes. You know, you'll be hard-pressed to find someone to say, oh, I'm racist. <laughs> um, 
I, I have an attitude. I mean, I like black people. I have black friends. You want, want to see them? Here they are. Look at the pictures on Facebook. <laughs> so folks felt like, you know, they have the knowledge, what they did or not. They felt like they had the disposition, that they had the attitude. But the one area that people fell down on is that they felt they didn't have the skills. Mm -hmm. And many times folks don't, don't have the skills because they're afraid. They're afraid of making mistakes. They're afraid of... Um, treading into a territory where they're not going to have a lot of um, knowledge about. And um, so you have to give them the skills. So this particular activity really forced them to go and see in real time where their knowledge and their dispositions could lead to them developing some skills. You know, as a higher ed and student affairs professional and as a professor in this area, I always tell my students, you know, in classes, you know, many times I will write on the board when we start two major things I want you to do. Problematize and deconstruct. Problematize everything. You're being trained at the doctoral level, PhD, EDD, so you are to be able to, um, you know, everybody has issues, you know. People Magazine has issues. What we study are problems. How can you take this issue and frame it into a problem? So you need to problematize these issues, problematize these issues of race and make it a problem. And so when we look at um, problematizing and then deconstructing, don't just take it because it was written on paper. You know, I've said to my black and white and brown students, you know, just because white folks wrote it down doesn't mean that it's real. I want you to deconstruct these theories. Hence, um, my uh, latest book, it should be out actually in um, about another month now. We're doing the finishing touches, touches on it. It's looking at alternative student affairs development frameworks. So what I wanted to do, you know, tried and true all these years, you know, we do the Chickering and Riser, we do the Astons, we do the Pascarella Terenzini's, um, we do the Perry's, we do the Kohlberg's, which is great. I'm not saying throw out those theories, but I am saying that there are some alternative, alternative approaches that we can use to study and theorize about Blackness and about Black people and about LGBTQ people. So this is going to be an entire book looking at alternative student affairs development frameworks, trying to give them some skills that, as Dr. Donna Ford has so eloquently said in, in all of her working bodies, give them some skills that are culturally specific skills. You can't just apply writ large these theories and say that they're going to work for everyone because we know that they don't necessarily work in um, their nuances. So yeah. knowledge, attitudes, and skills. So all these things are very, very important that we have to look at. Yeah, these are very strange um, times because as Dr. Southern mentioned earlier, we're also dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic as well. And of course, the rise in all of these racial incidents as well. Um, I want to go around if we can, maybe of two or three things that um, again, as higher education leaders, whether faculty or staff or even, even ambitious students uh, can do to help change the climate on their campus. Um, uh, we'll start with you, uh, Dr. Sutler. Sure, the first thing that comes to mind is to take down the shrines to white supremacy that are on many of our campuses. Um, Dr. Ford and I were at Vanderbilt at the time when Confederate Memorial Hall was a place where many students were uh, going to bed at night. That's, that's changed, um, but as long as we have memorialized uh, slavers and segregationists, it's going to be very difficult for us to make the case that higher education has moved in a positive direction toward being a supportive environment uh, for students of color and for black students in particular. Um, beyond that, in the context of COVID-19, um, you know, as, as so many institutions begin to ramp up, you know, I saw an interesting um, question posed on Twitter the other day, and whenever you see something that's profound on Twitter, you have to stop and look at it twice, but it said, would your reopening plan pass IRB? And so I think we're, we're pushing to get students back onto campuses. We want to like, quote, get back to normal. But when normal was a crisis for everyone we've talked about in the last hour and a half. So we need to fundamentally rethink how we're doing the business of higher education to be more equitable. And when you think about who's going to be at greatest risk for exposure to COVID, um, in general, that's going to be folks who are from low income communities and from communities of color. How are your um, staff going to be protected? If you're talking about having football again, um, and you're going to have half of your stadium full 
what's the income level going to be of the people who are in that stadium versus who's going to be on the playing field. So I think foregrounding these questions of equity and the notion of reopening our campuses is really important. And I would direct you to some comments by Dr. Michael Sorrell, the president of Paul Quinn College, who's been writing about this extensively. Um, he says it better than I can, and other speakers should, should weigh in. But those are the top things that come to mind um, for me on that question. Thank you. Dr. Solomon Fernandez. Thank you. Um, so I think for me, uh, of course, I'm influenced by the space where I am right now. And I would say, one, we need to conduct training. And two, our colleagues, our white colleagues don't know as much as they think they do. Um, and we also need to provide the professional development that Dr. Boner was talking about. Um, I think it's really important for us and for folks to realize and to come to this work with a humility, with a level of humility. I may not know this, and yes, I may have read about it, I may have studied about it, but the lived experiences of people of color um, and other people across the diversity spectrum speak so much more, um, is so much more real than what we read about and what we think we know. And who is doing those trainings? And um, what I find is that generally, we have a lot of people who are very progressive thinking, but what they don't realize is how do I react when I get a student whose experiences don't fall into the box, right? Yeah. Who may be angry, who may have, um, you know, who is overcoming so many things that I can't even understand. What is it like when I have a person of color in a position of power over me? How do I react to that? How do I think about that? How do I process that? And whose voice do I listen to? And how am I being challenged? Do I allow myself to accept to be challenged in this way? Or do I want this to conform to what I know and to be more confirmatory rather than challenging? So I think we are in a moment of time right now where we do need to put the resources around um, training, around professional development, and ensuring that people are really being pushed to do the hard work. Um, and also to look at real experiences, those moments of discomfort, um, and to be able to accept it when our students, when our peers, when other people say, this is what my experience has been, rather than validating, well, I've been doing this, I've been doing that, this is how I approach this work. Um, and I understand it is a challenge when you, don't, when you don't have a lot of resources and when you don't have um, a lot of, when your area is, um, is, is very heterogeneous. Um, so for me, as I look at it, I, I think about my colleagues that's my audience, my other leaders to say, what are the experiences of people of color on your, on your campuses? How do you solicit that? And also how do you protect them? Because it's asking them to have a lot of courage and to take risks, especially when there are so few of them and they can, you know, some of these experiences can then go back to them. So how do you protect them? How do you elevate them, make, make space for them, but also with our um, white colleagues, how do we help their education? Because I think a lot of people have great intentions, um, yeah. but intentions aren't enough. So putting those resources where they need to be. Well said, we've got about two minutes. So Dr. Bonner and then Dr. Ford to end us out. Yes. I just very quickly want to say that the first thing that we need to do is individuals need to check themselves. Who are you and what do you believe? You can't help me until you first help yourself. It's just like the airline. You got to put on your seatbelt first. <laughs> All right, Dr. Ford. Oh, what can I say? Um, training is essential and I, I want it to be done by authentic scholars who know what they're doing and not placate the status. Quote, mm -hmm. if, we, if we truly um, want to make a difference, then we are going to do what it takes. And again, no pain, no gain, authentic. And by the way, this may need to be some unpacked, but I'm not going, we don't have time maybe. Part two, Dr. Watson. All right, all right, part, part two. It needs to be done by authentic Black people too. Absolutely. Well, thank you all panelists for, for being with us, for engaging in this important conversation. And now I will turn it back over to Sine Reese. Thanks so much for, host, for, for joining us today. You can view past Diverse Talk Live webcast on our website. Now talking about 
keep it real diverse, create a more compassionate and empathetic community across racial, class, religious, ethnic, and all divides. Go to www.diverseeducation.com and access all of these opportunities at the top of the homepage to enhance your awareness, your efforts, as well as your engagement. Keep it real diverse too. We still have a ways to go. Are you looking for ways to have those difficult conversations about race, sexuality, politics, class, and all lives matter? Get ahead of these conversations on your campus this fall. Keep It Real Diverse 2 is the perfect tool for getting students, staff, and faculty to have sympathetic empathy and understanding of one another. Check out the special that's going on right now. The offer expires on July 31st, 2020. Thank you all. Thank Great you. Be with you. All right. Bye-bye. Yeah.